Howdy, everybody. All right. So we're getting started right away. That's wonderful. All right. So Anthony says that he discovered my three levels of rest video and says that it's brilliant. <laughs> um, and he's going to start doing that. So that's great. You know, the three levels of rest is uh, something that I think a lot of people don't realize is, you know, let me put it this way. You know, when when people come in and they have truck problems, it's sort of like, you know, when, when my dad taught me how to, to fix cars, right? He says, before you do anything, get the thing tuned up. He says, before you do anything, tune it up because for if for no other reason, it's going to help you figure out easier what's wrong, right? But there's also this chance that, that you could um, fix something that, that was just spark plugs or something and, and spend a lot of money. And I, I do the same thing with, with students. If they come in and they're having shop problems, the first thing we do the very first thing we do is look at these three levels of rest. And almost always, that first level, the beat level, almost always, they play, 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 turn the page, turn the page, turn the page, and they don't ever take the horn off their chops. Um, that's, I think that's probably the most common uh, source of chop problems in most students. Now, I don't, I don't just assume that. Sometimes people have chop problems for other reasons. I'm just saying it's the most common, which that just means it could be more than 50%, right? Richard asks, how was my jazz gig? How I'm doing? I'm doing great, Richard. Um, the jazz gig was good. There's a picture on on Facebook, it was a, a Dixieland jazz, and it, it was a small gig. I think there were about 40 people in the audience, which is, that's like the smallest audience I've played for in a long, long time. So, um, and the room, the room wasn't much bigger than my living room. So, um, and that might be an exaggeration, but yeah, it was a small room. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, any questions today? There were no questions in the email or anything like that. And um, so we're wide open today talking about stuff. You know, doing different styles of jazz. That's. Let me tell you a story. I, I played a gig once with the Guy Lombardo band. If you're not familiar with Guy Lombardo, um, I don't know that we would call that jazz, but it is a style of swing. And they do sometimes have some solos in it. So the Guy Lombardo band comes to Houston. I'm subbing for this guy that used to be president of the union, his, his name, um, I forgot, E.C. Holland, he used to be president of the musicians union here. He couldn't do the gig, I got called, <clears throat> and it was awful. It was awful. I mean, I was awful, <laughs> you know? And, and I was kind of cocky when I went to the gig because I thought, you know, at the time, I was making my living playing salsa. And salsa, everyone had always told me salsa was the hardest style of music to sight read. And I could sight read salsa like that. I could. I was so good in those days, talking about the 90s. Um, I was so good at sight reading in salsa that if the chart had mistakes in it, I could tell it had mistakes in it without having to go through it first, and I would play it correctly, not because I knew the tune, but because I knew the style. 
and there were many times because you know now the, uh, in salsa the charts are normally written very well but there are there used to be this guy that we would read his charts from from uh chile i think it was chile either chile or peru but um and his looked like hieroglyphics. It was uh, the notes. The note wasn't connected to the stem, and the flag wasn't connected to the stem. It was just like just little bits of notes all over the page. Uh, but I got to where I could read that stuff real well. But anyway, so so I get to this Guy Lombardo gig, thinking that thinking um, hi hierarchically, right? Linearly, thinking linearly, thinking that, well, if I can sight read salsa without making mistakes, then surely I can sight read Guy Lombardo. Well, it doesn't work like that. You have to be familiar with that style. So I had never really listened at that point in my life. I had never really listened to any Guy Lombardo. And... Boy, it, it was just, I, I stepped in holes all over the place. I kept anticipating because the, the Guy Lombardo style is a little bit more like. <laughs> stuff like that. Um, it sounds almost like a march the way I played it. on the, That probably wasn't a good. But yes, the, there's far less syncopation in the Guy Lombardo stuff, and I kept, like, anticipating, anticipating, uh, stepping in holes all over the place. And I, I think any kind of stylistic difference you want to make, this is what I, what I got from that experience, is when you want to change styles, you, you better be familiar with that style. You know, if you... So like this gig that I did on Friday, uh, it was a Dixieland gig. If you want to play Dixieland music, you better be playing, uh, but you better be listening to Dixieland so that you know how that goes. I'll never forget, you know, I also had a lot of time. By the time I started playing dance, big band dance music, here in Houston, that scene had almost dried up by that time. So they went from working five nights a week to working two times a month. But I was in it. I, I think that was what, what was happening. It was like, you know, it wasn't enough to, for guys to make a living off of. And since I was new to the scene, you know, it, I kind of got my my got established with those guys so from for all through the 90s and into the new millennium uh i was playing with these great big band dance bands and i remember one time where we had a sub on tenor sax and he great kid he sight read everything perfectly but when he stood up to take a solo he played more like Coltrane style, and it just showed how little he knew about the style he was playing. You know, and and the way you get that ability to switch styles is really you have to spend time listening to it. Now with the big band stuff, I grew up listening to that stuff. So it was, I already had that. My dad used to listen to that stuff all the time. So um, me walking into that was, there was no issue there. It's very different. I should, I should stress that too. If you learned jazz, to, you know, if you learn to play jazz in a jazz band at school, it's not the same thing as playing with a dance band. Now there are, The stylistic difference is becoming less um, 
extreme nowadays because the old style of dance band music, the dance jazz, the big band jazz, that stuff is disappearing. And you don't have people in the bands now that know how to play it. It's, it's actually quite sad if you think about it. Sometimes I feel like, hey, you know, maybe I, I have a responsibility to like make a, put a band together to bring that music, you know, to, to, um, you know, not, I, I don't, I don't think it's ever going to be popular again, but it's, it's a kind of music that shouldn't be lost. I don't think it should ever be lost. So anyway, I'm just like rambling, huh? <laughs> that was a, a 10 minute rant. Um, are there any questions at all? Maybe this is going to be a short one. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, so yeah, that's my big thing with the style stuff. My very first gig on, on Dixieland music was in the mid-90s. And I had never played it before. If you want to master bebop, so that's, you know, if you want to master bebop, I think the first thing you should do is listen to a whole bunch of Charlie Parker. Okay, so yeah, it is really hard. Uh, the listening has a lot to do with it. You have to spend the time listening. That's not good enough, though. And I'm going to tell you about bebop. You're not going to learn how to play bebop by learn, learning scales. You're not going to learn how to play bebop by doing, uh, like, and, I, and as much as I love the book, Tony says, cut my gig with Jazz Forever. Yeah, I love that. That was a great band, Jazz Forever. So, um, looks like he might be typing some more. Um, so, so if you're going to try to learn bebop, it's not going to come from, what's that name? The Patterns for Jazz book. And I love that book. I, I did that book through high school and college. I, I spent nine years working on that book. Okay. And I love that book, but you're not going to learn how to play bebop from that book. That book is just to get your... The, the Patterns for Jazz is great for finger technique. It's great for your mind. Um, I would say that the first thing you want to do is transcribe a bunch of bebop heads. Even if you have them in a fake book, don't, don't get it from a fake book. Get it straight. Because, you know, the fake books don't have what it has on the, on the recording anyway. And that's how I learned the, the Dixieland stuff, by the way. Um, now there was no, there was no YouTube by that time, but I had just at that time sort of inherited my parents' albums because they didn't, they got a CD player, they didn't want the albums anymore, and I got all the albums here, and there was some Dixieland stuff in there. The leader called me up and said, "What tunes do you know?" I said, "None." And that's the other thing, right? It's a whole different set of tunes. Different tunes for for Dixieland. There's some overlap, but not much. Anyway, so that's how I did it. As, as I went to these old LPs that my, my parents had, and I found those tunes, and I transcribed them in, in 24 hours, by the way. It was less than 24. He, the guy called me, and I had less than 24 hours to learn all those tunes. It was just a one-hour gig. But anyway, um, when you learn a tune that way, 
you get all of the the nuances of the style. It's great. Um, you know, all there's there's tunes that I learned for that. <laughs> The, the way I play those tunes even today uh, came from um, from the transcriptions that I did. So that's what I would say. Transcribe some uh, transcribe some Charlie Parker tunes first. Bebop tunes. And so there's this thing that I teach about learning the language. So basically... Great bebop is really thick in the language. And the way you learn that language, first, is by listening to that language. And second, by doing transcriptions. And those solos, a few, Charlie Parker, um, Sonny Stitt, uh, any of those. Clifford Brown almost, too. Really, I, even though he's post bop, the the improvisation, his improvisation style still leans towards more of a bebop style. So that's what I, that's where I would start. Your question was, where would you start? Um, that's where I would start is transcriptions. As long as uh, as long as you're doing a lot of listening. So, Tony says, caught my gig with Jazz Forever a couple of years ago. My great arrangements. <laughs> As of now, Tony, Jazz Forever is gone, unfortunately. Um, thank you for com uh, complimenting my arrangements. I did 120 arrangements for that band. 120. So yeah, jazz forever unfortunately is is no longer a thing. So they're just I don't know I, I don't want to go into why and or into the history or all that. It, it is very unfortunate because that was something that was a a, a very nice um a very nice band a very nice experience. And, you know, as a writer, writing that many charts, uh, it, was, it was like a part-time job for me for three years. So I'd, I would get up in the morning, do my morning stuff, and then I would get right into the writing, and I'd write until the, my lessons started, maybe do some more writing after the lessons. And, you know, I was... I. I like to think that I was a good writer before I started doing Jazz Forever, but man, I got faster. My Finale Chops, I, I used Finale, it's a, a program for writing music. I used Finale, my Finale Chops got fast. Um, and also what came out of that is a template that I use. I'm still using that template today. Because the more I spent time doing this stuff, the more I'm looking at, like, um, things that could make... You know, it's great as a writer to have your music played. So then you get this, like, feedback loop going. And so you write the tune, you go to the, the gig, and if things got weird for a moment, you look back at the chart and say, why did it get weird here? You know, we recorded with those guys... We did, I want to say, four albums or six albums. I can't remember. I think it's four albums. Maybe five. Anyway, um, it was so validating to me with Jazz Forever because I would write these charts, and we would go to the studio. No rehearsal. We would go to the studio, no rehearsal, and they would play the chart right the first time. 
It was it was another. I mean, that says a lot about the guys playing in Jazz Forever, and it also says um, a lot. I'm, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that the if the writing is right, you know, you don't have to fix stuff. So that was a real um, milestone for me. I'm not I'm not bragging about it. I'm just saying it was a milestone. Richard says, I know there is a lot of theory and around jazz, but what are the essential theoretical skills a professional really needs? So, you know, the thing about the theory is that it should be, how, do, how am I saying this? The theory should be learned on your horn. That's how I see it. And for bebop, I wouldn't worry so much about, you know, when we talk about jazz theory, let me tell you what I do with my students. And this is a little different from what people would learn from the, the, the Co Coker book, you know, the patterns for jazz. Long before we start playing, um, long before we start playing the 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 chord progressions, you need to be able to play the chords themselves. So let's say let's say the first, and we do this with with the students. We go through each of the the tunes and we look at every chord, and we do. Uh, arpeggios over that chord. Let's say the first chord is C7. Now, what I do is I have the students stare at the chord on the paper while they do this. They're going to do that 10 times. Right? Take it off your lips each time. And then, then add the fifth. And do that 10 times. And then add the seventh. Do that 10 times. And then add the root. And we're going to take that, doing 10 times each, all the way up to your top range, all the way down to your bottom range, so that in the end, you're doing something like this. And you're doing that while you're looking at the chord symbol. And what that does is you're creating a, a connection between seeing the chord symbol and the, we're trying to create a trigger, right? So that you automatically associate that chord symbol with those notes. So that's the first thing we do for the theory. I would much rather my students do learn the theory about the chords because usually when people say jazz theory, they're just talking about the chords. That's really what they're talking about, right? And which is not really... Okay, so there is... You know, there's more than just the chords. I, I, what am I saying? I, I've painted myself in a corner. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I guess the reason I'm stuttering is because I just realized that I'm now guilty of something I keep talking about other people. Um, because, you know, I don't like approaching the music, just thinking about chords. You know, there's, there's people, here's how they tell you to practice the blues, right? Uh, anyway, so that's how they tell you to practice the blues. Um, and that doesn't do anything to get you there. 
So that's not the kind of theory that I'm talking about, okay? So there is theory that's more advanced, but you don't have to know all that if you're doing the language. A lot of that, a lot of that more advanced theory is built into the language. You, if you learn the language, you don't have to worry about all that. And that's where a lot of people go wrong, right? They, they think that the way you learn jazz is to learn all that theory and then create your own language on the gig, on the, in the performance. That's how it's being taught by a lot of people. And that's awful. That's not how it works. Learn the language. Use your theory later to look at, hey, those notes and those notes, the reason they sound so good is because of this theory. Okay? But you don't need to know the theory to... So the, what I told you earlier about doing the, the um, transcriptions, that kind of bypasses the theory. There's one exception, though. So the chords, you should be able to tell what key you're in by looking at the chords. That's about as advanced a theory you need to get started. Now, there's stuff I do with, with the theory that, like playing outside and stuff like that. There's things I do that is theoretically very advanced compared to just getting started. So, um, so yeah, the, w in terms of theory, I wouldn't worry about that. I would really spend most of that time looking at the transcriptions. Anyway, so Tony says it was an organic group. Yes, it was. It was very nice. I enjoyed that band so much. Um, are the CDs available? I have some here. Um, the CDs are... You know, the, the I have some CDs here. I don't know which ones I've got and which ones I don't have. Um, not offhand, I mean. And so if you would like some, I can... I'll find some way to get some to you. And uh, But otherwise, you can listen to two of them online. We've got the last two. We've got the Christmas one. And we've got the, um, what is it? The, we've got a Mardi Gras one and a Christmas one. The Christmas one is spiked eggnog. <laughs> and um, the, the Mardi Gras one is called Mardi Gras Legends. So those two are both on YouTube, actually. So Richard says he studied piano for six years. Drilled them on, oh, we're talking about the chords, right. So my thing about 12 keys, some say to do it in 12 keys. My thing about doing things in 12 keys is that's great for technique. It doesn't help you with your improv. Your improv is from your mind and Okay, so it's, I, I shouldn't say it doesn't help you at all, but it doesn't help you much. That's my opinion. I know people disagree with me on that. Um, that's right. So your next comment is that it, you do, it takes a long time and you don't seem to really get anything out of it. So this is where my concept of tonalization studies, uh, tonalization comes into play. So I have these scale studies, right? Now, I'm not telling people to go get those scale studies, but those scale studies are actually part of the tonalization concept. It's not the whole thing. It's not just a tonalization. Um, you know, the more time you spend in one key, the more that key is absorbed into the way you think, jazz-wise. So instead of taking something like this, instead of taking that and going, instead of doing it up in half steps like that, what you would do, so 
the way I do the, so this is language stuff, right? That's a two five one that I just did. Um, uh, let's say I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do that one. I always sing the thing in between repetition, but then I'll do that ten times. I'll do that ten times. Then I'll do it. I want to do it as, in as many octaves as I can. I'll do that ten times. Not going so well today, but you know when I sound terrible, it's because I'm trying to keep my. You know, it's like I don't play well like that. So excuses, excuses. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Um, I would do that. I'll take the same two five one neck, play it ten times in that octave, play it, play it ten times in the other octave. Then I would do another two five one neck in that same key. Do it ten times in that octave, ten times in another octave. Then I would do another one in that same key, ten times in this octave, ten times in this octave. If you can do three octaves, do three octaves. And you go through all of the two five ones you've collected. That's how I teach this. Learning the language. If you've got uh, two five ones that you're learning, learn them all in one key. And by the way, what key should it be? The key that the tune you're working on is in. That's the key you should be working on. Okay. And that's the tonalization concept, is that you spend more time in one key. That's how we do that. You spend more time in one key, don't. So let's say hypothetically, you want to play. Now, here's the problem with jazz, right? Most of the tunes are in at least two keys. It's very rare to have a tune that's that, okay, I shouldn't say very rare, but it's it's more common to have a tune that has more than one key. A good example. Um, Right, so that's, I've already gone through like four different keys right there. It doesn't sound like it because the tune's, it's a really, really nice tune, right? Um, Stella by Starlight. The first two key, first two chords are in one key. Uh, for us, talking trumpet notes, E minor for us. The second two note, two chords, two measures, are in a different key. Then we have another, I think it's three measures that were in another key. So that's all the way, all the way there, we're already in three keys. Okay. Then I, well, my favorite part is at the end where it's doing minor keys down in whole steps. Very cool. Um, but that's the problem with that's the problem with jazz tunes is you got to know so many keys. So when we're talking about doing their two five one licks all in one key, you need to know when you're learning a jazz tune, what keys is the tune in? Sometimes a tune will be in two keys. Oh, let's, here's a great example, right? Um, Blue Bossa. That's the first two key tune that I do with my students. And I like it because you've got eight bars of, now you could say, well, it's going minor to major. When it comes to your technique, I won't go into why that's true, but it is. 
okay so i don't consider when we're talking about keys i don't consider those two to be two different keys i know some people are like like having conniptions listening to that now because they they everything to them is about the chords i don't see it that way so in my opinion the first eight bars of of um blue Bossa are in our f e flat concert Yes, I know it's really C minor concert or D minor concert, but I say F because of, I call it the technique pool. The same technique pool works in F as it does in D minor, so we're not talking about that. But then it modulates for uh, four bars to our E flat. That's a great tune for, for students that haven't changed keys yet. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, that's a great tune because you're gonna you're gonna have a place in the in the tune where you're gonna have to change a key. So, to me, that's so when you when you're working on that tune, you need to do all of your two five ones in the key of F. And D minor, if you're going to be doing minor two five ones, which is a good idea. I don't actually teach two five ones anymore, um, but I don't have time to go into what it uh, what it is that we do um, instead. Then you need to do all over again those same two five ones from all of them, all of the ones that you have, and and you should have like a notebook where you're collecting these things. A notebook where you're collecting all the two five ones you've got and do them again in E flat. That way you have the 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 language that goes with both keys in that song. And talking about the theory, that's really the most uh, when we're talking about getting started, that's the most important theory that you have is to be able to look at the chord progressions and figure out what key you're in. That's the theory that you need to know. Look at the chords and say, what, what key are we in? And the 2-5-1 is a big part of that, but not all tunes are just 2-5-1. Okay? Okay. Uh, the Blue Boss is part of that, right? Blue Bossa starts off on our D minor. And then it goes to G minor. And then it goes back to D minor. Um, oh. I skipped two chords, sorry. Anyway, um, but you get the idea, right? So we're we we're in that key for eight bars, and then we then we get to the two five one in in E flat. Anyway, so you get. You get the language going in those two different keys, and then you then that's part of the fun, right? Is spend the time improvising over that tune. I strongly recommend Band in a Box as a program to do with your computer. If you can't do computer, you can do um, iReal Pro on your phone, or alternatively, you can go to uh, whatever tune it is that you're working on. You can pull it up on. Uh, YouTube, there's backing track, so type the name of the tune and then type backing track and search on YouTube and almost all the tunes now have backing tracks. So I hope that makes sense. I'm kind of rambling on. I hope I'm answering questions here. Are there any other questions? My way of teaching jazz is very, very different. 
And I think that's why I haven't put so much up online because it's, yeah, it's extremely involved. The, the way I teach jazz is a lot of hard work, <laughs> a lot of hard work. Now what's that said, I think people sound better with my system than with other people's systems earlier on. I think, I think traditionally, I think traditionally people tend to teach a more of a sink or swim kind of approach to jazz. And my students tend to sound better earlier because I, I know how to get um, the way I teach. I know how to get them to sound good now. Part of that is picking the right tunes, of course. Um, anyway, I'm still rambling. <laughs> so I'm real tired today. I changed the radiator in my car today. I know that's not music related, but I am very tired. I, I actually wasn't going to do it all today. I originally planned to finish up tomorrow, but it came out so quickly. I had it out by noon, and I thought, well, might as well finish it up. So I finished it up, but I'm tired. I, I was um, only washed up like an hour before the, this, this um, chat started. So, yes, I do my own auto repairs. <laughs> I have been, you know... You learn to do that when you, at least that's how I see it, as a professional musician, you don't have, um, when you're first starting out, you don't have all that money to go just pay someone do that stuff. I saved today literally hundreds of dollars by doing this by myself. Hundreds of dollars. So, and that, and it's, Normally, I probably wouldn't have done that, I, but it's January. January is one of the slowest months of the year for musicians. So, oh, excuse me. So, yeah, I figured I might as well do it. I know how to do it. I'm pretty good at it. Not to brag, but been doing it for like 40 years now, 30 years, something like that. Um, anyway. Any other questions? Maybe we'll make this a short one. Maybe not. We'll see. One of these days, I'm going to share with you guys how I've been, my, my new approach to learning tunes. It's wonderful. I'm very excited about it. Did you ever question yourself becoming a musician or was it right from the start without doubt to become a musician? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, did you ever question whether I would be a music, you know. So l l let me tell you this. My answer, you know, I don't, how am I going to say this? When I was in seventh grade, I had, and this is, you know, I didn't go to the kind of church where people talk about this kind of thing, okay? About talking to God and hearing from God and stuff like that. The kind of church I always went to was, you know, basic Methodist, Baptist kind of churches, okay? So we never talked about um, having conversations with God, but I did. So this is just something that, was, that came from me, 
my relationship with Jesus Christ as I got it from the Bible, not from other people. Okay, so I had a conversation with God when I was in seventh grade. I keep I keep messing up the camera. Sorry about that. Um, I had a conversation with God, and God told me that for as long as his love shines through my music, he will provide for all of my earthly needs. So, and I've stood on that all these years. That was that was 45 years ago. A little over 45 years ago. God promised me that if his love shined through my music, he would take care of everything I needed. So the question is, did I ever have, did I ever question? I never questioned what I was doing. That said, sometimes I wanted to quit. <laughs> there were times, <laughs> you know, that's kind of funny, right? So here I am on the one hand, I'm saying, oh, well, God told me he would take care of me. <laughs> but, you know, that doesn't make it any less frustrating. So I have I had this to stand on my whole life, and, and I tell you that, if it weren't for having that conversation with God early on, if I hadn't had that conversation, I probably, well, I don't know. It's hard to say, you know, stuff like that, but I think having that conversation change stuff. So even in the darkest moments, that promise kept me going. And, um, and you know, I still, to this day, I, I don't always think of it like in that moment, right? I don't always think of it. Let, let's say I'm on stage performing. I don't always think in terms of expressing God's love through my horn. But it's often enough that I think about it. I think about it when I'm practicing. I think about sharing God's love through my music, not through my talking, right? I'm, I'm not talking ab about that. I'm talking about through the, the music that I make, I think about it when I'm practicing. I, I actually use God's love as a guide to help me figure out what I need to practice. Now, don't get me wrong. It wasn't always like that. In the early 90s, it was in the early 90s when I kind of figured this out. In the early 90s, I, I, I think I was more normal. <laughs> I think I was more normal in those days because what I practiced was what I wanted to... I wanted everybody to know how wonderful I was, right? So my practice was like, based on that, I would practice this hard stuff and practice that hard stuff. And, and just so I could be a better player so that people would know that I was doing a good job, right? That's a disaster. For, for me, that was a disaster. That was a disaster. And, and you can see why, right? Because when it came to the performance side of what I was doing, it was still that God's love thing. But then what I was preparing for was actually a lot more selfish than that. So it was in the mid-90s when I started seeing... My practice, let me turn on the light. Sorry about that.
it was in the mid nineties when I started seeing a conflict between the way I was practicing and the way I was performing. So I started, I started letting the Holy Spirit guide through love. This happens through love, right? You have to have that, that, and it's odd, right? Because I'm an introvert. My personality type rubs people the wrong way. It's always rubbing people the wrong, the wrong way, right? So some people would think, um, some of people would, people would think that um, that I'm not the kind of person that would love people, right? But it's it's not true. It's just that my love happens. <laughs> My love for the people happens along this venue, right? The, the way I practice, the, the way I choose what to practice, it's all based on love for the people. So I stopped practicing all the show-off stuff. I stopped practicing. Now, it doesn't mean I don't practice technique. Of course I practice, practice technique, okay? But the reason I'm doing it now is different because it's based on being able to do the job that I'm hired to do. Right? So anyway, yes, I've had I've I've had a lot of frustrating. It used to be every day. It used to be every single day that I would want to quit. Then it the, the time between those episodes got longer and longer apart. And I I haven't felt that way for a while now. I think I average like once or twice a year now where I get up and it's like, just want to quit. <laughs> right? So anyway, I hope that answers your question. Um, ACAC asks, how do I get rid of nerves during a chair test? Well, nerves in a chair test is the same as nerves in any other thing, okay? So, you know, I think you were one of the ones we were talking to last week, wasn't it? And weren't we talking about nerves last week? I'm going to say my biggest thing is to get rid of stage fright is to – now, you know, the, the, the thing about chair test, that really could be something else. But let me talk about this. If you allow yourself to have emotional reactions during your practice time, you're going to have a really rough time not doing that in your in your chair test. And that's the biggest thing I've been sharing with people about stage fright is learning self-control during your practice time. I call them musical temper tantrums, right? Some people stamp their feet. Some people, right? Um, there's stories I've heard about people doing really, really horrible things out of anxiety while they're practicing. You know, there's something that you could try doing. You know, we started this chat off with Anthony saying that he was checking out my three levels of rest video. And the first of those three levels is the rest as long as you play level. And I think that when you rest as long as you play, so basically how that how that works is you, you practice something and you finger sing and finger it. And you play it again. And you sing and finger it. And you do that back and forth. Take the instrument off of your lips. That's how you do 
that first level of rest is the singing finger played. Singing finger played back and forth. But one of the things that does for your stage fright, sorry about that. One of the things that does for your stage fright is it slows down your practice process. And instead of being, oh, you know, play, 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 you, go, you know, it slows everything down and it calms you down. Being more calm in your practice time is going to lead to being more calm in your performance time. It's just the way it works. Okay. Now, let's talk about specifically chair test. You know, one thing that can make you nervous, and I know this because this is what my this was the root of my stage fright, is unforgiveness. It's okay to have a competitive, you know, friendly competition with your with your um, the other musicians in your band. It's not. It's good to have friendly competition, but it's also possible to develop some animosity towards your competition and want to beat them so bad that you could have issues with unforgiveness. And here's how unforgiveness works in a competition. If you, okay, maybe unforgiveness is the wrong word. Being critical of somebody else. Let's say you let's say you listen to this guy and you say, Oh, he's awful, he's got a bad sound, and he doesn't play in time, and all this stuff. I can play better than him, right? So then you go and you go to your, your chair test. And the Bible says, Judge not that you be not judged. Right? What that means is if you don't judge other people, you won't be judged yourself. And I do believe there's a psychological element to that. I do believe that when we judge other people, when we say, oh, that guy is horrible, he sounds bad, and we, when we do that, and then it's our turn, we can't stop being that way to ourselves. So when, 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 we're, when we're talking bad about other people, And then it's our turn. We're going to have stage fright. That's how it goes. Because you stand, when you condemn other people, you stand, and I'm, I don't know anything, I don't know anything about you. I don't know if this applies to you. Okay? I have no way to, I have no way of knowing if this applies to you. Okay? I'm just saying because it is chair test. That's an, a, a possibility. If you go around condemning other people and then it's your turn to stand up there, you will condemn yourself on a subconscious psychological level. If you want to stand up there and not feel condemned, then you have to not be condemning anybody else because you can't turn it. The only people I think that can turn that off are people who are like psychopath. They don't feel those kind of things. Right? But if you go around talking about how bad other people are, you're going to have problems like that on stage. And it's going to come, it's going to be uh, uh, emphasized. It's going to be emphasized when you are doing a chair test because it's, it's, that's an intimate competition, right? We're, we're talking about people that you see every day. These are people you see every day. And you're going... And especially if you've been saying that you're better than that guy, I'm better than that guy, I'm going to go, uh, right? And now it's on, huh? 
anyway, that's how I see it. I, I that's. I won't tell you my story, but this is very. That's something that I had to to work out in my life. Um, it wasn't that I thought I was better than anybody, but I was criticizing people for certain things in my career. So, um, so yeah, that that is a thing. So that's what I have. I would say, take all of the emotional reactions out of your practice time. And one really good way to do that is the, the, the levels of rest. And then um, start forgiving the people. Don't go around uh, talking bad about your competition. And start being more forgiving of the people who, you know, what, why would I use the word forgiving? Maybe you feel like you that person doesn't deserve to be ahead of you. Right? You have to forgive that guy or girl so that... Does that make sense? If you forgive that person for being ahead of you when they, when they don't deserve to be ahead of you, then a lot of this these feelings go away. And I, like I said, I have to say this one more time. I'm not saying that applies to you, okay? I don't know. I can't know that. I'm just saying this is a thing, okay? All right. Well, we did a whole hour. That's great. I'll give, I'll, let's, let's give you guys a little bit time to have one more question. If I, if we, if we have one more question, I'll answer that, and then we'll move on. It's, so I'll give you a few minutes. Anyway. All right, so very good. God bless you guys. Thanks for hanging out with me. Um, we will probably do this again next week. Um, and if you have any questions, I know some people watch these later. If you have any questions, please feel free to um, email me through my website, eddielewis.com, or you can have add comments or whatever to a video, and I will um, talk about them in the next Q&A. All right. Well, very good. Nice to see you guys. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you. See you guys. Bye.